It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, where, where each week we seek inspiration from great men and women to become the heroes and heroines of our own lives. So you are here with our hosts. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? Uh, I am unbelievable today, Andy. Ready to celebrate a man who had more lives than a team of cats. <laughs> and he took more <laughs> lives, 116 minimum, during World War II. This guy was Rambo before Rambo, if we could use that yeah, yeah. expression. This, yeah, that's a good point. This guy was Rambo in real life, not in, not in fiction. And we're talking, of course, yeah. about Arthur Wormuth, who was famous during World War II as the one-man army of baton. Uh, who, with his uh, yes. with his Filipino Rangers, fought uh, fought to defend the Bataan Peninsula from uh, the invading Japanese forces. Of course, they were overwhelmed by superior numbers, and yes. the Japanese military was very formidable. But they put up a ferocious defense. And Wormuth, uh, known to the Americans as and the Filipinos as the one man army of Bataan, was known even more insidiously to the Japanese as the ghost of Bataan. You know, for reasons Ghost. that we will discuss. <laughs> yeah, but he was a formidable yeah. warrior. Not just what he did during the, in combat, but how he survived the brutal mistreatment of several years as a Japanese POW, where so many other guys yes. died. Your worm had survived. Some of the themes, Andy, I'd like to talk about today. Why do we call military leaders heroes? Uh, what about the savagery of war? What accounts for that? And then another one is the difference between being rash and being courageous. Those are good questions, Robert. I think Captain Wormuth crossed the line into rashness, to, to, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but well, it's, you it's an interesting phenomenon, you know. It's an interesting yeah. phenomenon. So, so yeah, if we could tell what he does. So, Japan, you know, December nineteen forty-one attack. America, Philippines are on the way to America. It's a part of the American territory. Uh, due to the Spanish-American War, in case you didn't know that, 1898. And uh, Japan is just marching, or we talked about this in the Midway episode, they're just marching farther east on their way to take over as much of the Pacific. And America was not prepared. America was not fully armed. So what they had to do is they, they were outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned, as the, as the Hamilton yeah. musical says. And yes. they, needed, they needed leadership like right away to, to get a Filipino army, you know, like 150 or so of the Filipinos, the locals who want to defend their own lives. They're certainly uh, selfishly invested in this war. And, and captains like Arthur Wormertz, and he, Andy, so courage and rashness. So this man goes behind enemy lines and attacks them from behind, which I could not do. I consider myself somewhat courageous, but I'm not cut out for doing that kind of thing, Andy. I don't want to be caught behind enemy lines. And, and he, he, you know, when he would attack them from yeah, behind. Especially not, an enemy, especially not an enemy as brutal as the Japanese. You know what they're going to do to you if they capture you. No. No, especially not that kind of uh, uh, a force. And this is in the jungle. So the music I'm yeah, hearing right. in the background of this is Creedence Clearwater Revival run, revival, run Through the Jungle. That's what I'm kind of hearing. Because you have to deal with the elements. You have to deal with hostile uh, um, captives, you know, taking over this island. And here's Wormer, it's an American, you know, lived his whole life in America and did some survival skills in, in Michigan while he was training but uh so how do you do this how, how do you and and when he attacks them from behind they think there's a full army and it's just him with his tommy yeah. gun and two pistols and and just what he's a one man this is why they literally call him a one-man army yeah well he, they they said he killed a, a minimum 116 japanese soldiers in combat you know this is yeah. bloody war is hell sherman's right i'm a devout coward you know i want peace you know, and, and celebrating all this bloody, gory stuff, you know, is, is horrific. But what are you going to do when you're under attack from, you know, a powerful totalitarian, say a powerful dictatorship? You have to stand up, you know, and, and fight for liberty. And, 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 and Wormuth did. Uh, yes. Amazing, with amazing courage and, and prowess. I just want to tell a, a, a personal story here, Rob, because yeah, I was like 10, I was like 10 years old. And I was reading, I don't, I don't even have the book anymore. I don't even remember the title of the book anymore. It was a 
you know, I was always a hero worshiper. I'm reading a book on war heroes. There's a chapter titled The One Man Army of Bataan. I said, whoa, <laughs> that's a grabber, right? And so I read the chapter on Arthur Wormuth. And I mean, I, I mean, I was like, my jaw fell. I, I, I'm with you. I, there's certain things I could do. I, I, would, I wouldn't even consider this. First of all, crawling th along through the jungle in the dead of night in the darkness where there's venomous snakes and poisonous insects, you know, and Japanese infiltrators coming, Japanese, you know, uh, commandos coming to infiltrate the American lines. And this, this is what the chapter focused on. Wormuth and his Filipino ranges, you know, crawled out into no man's land with knives because it had to be done silently, maybe silence pistols, I don't remember, with knives, you know, and intercept the Japanese infiltrators, fight with knives, fight to the death. Yeah, I just, this is just horrific. I mean, but the, the yeah. courage and the prowess here that, you know, Wormuth survived all of this and, you yeah. know, killed a lot of invading Japanese soldiers in the attempt to defend the Philippines, uh, you know, from Japanese yeah. conquest. I, some know, of these I, stories about about the one man army, you can't make this stuff up. You know what I mean? It's so off the charts. <laughs> what, what were you saying, Robert? Just two two follow-ups on that. So you've had this man in your life since you're 10 years old. I heard about him a week ago, <laughs> okay? And I've, you know, done a crash course in Worm Earth. And part of the tragedy is there should be feature length films on this man. There should be full documentaries on this man. He should be in reading lists of the, like you got from this one book, I think it's called Heroes of War, some something like that, but he's got a chapter in it. But the men's leg legend, you know, especially for, for older people has inspired you, you know, f since you're 10. And this is what heroes do. This is why we celebrate, you know, people like right. Arthur Warren, right. his story. Right, I've thought about Arthur, you know, there's various times in my life I've been afraid to do one thing or another, have surgery on my knee, old basketball injury. Who wants to go into surgery? It's scary. And so I think, Man, if Arthur Wormuth could take on the snakes and the poisonous insects and the invading Japanese forces crawling through the jungle alone at night with a knife and everything, you know, well, I could certainly go into surgery in a friendly environment with skilled, trained surgeons. You know, I could, I could do this. And, you know, you're right. This is we get courage and we get inspiration from what, what Arthur Wormuth, you know, from what heroes do. And yeah. Some of these stories. Uh, by the way, you're right. During World War II, you know, before both of our times, but we both grew up in an era when a lot of World War II veterans were still alive. And um, greatest generation. You know, right, right. Uh, the ge mm -hmm. generation of Americans that defeated Hitler and Imperial Japan. And many, many war veterans, World War II or otherwise, you know, they don't want to share their stories except with other war veterans because, understandably, because it's so horrific that people who are in, in life and death combat really can't can't relate to it. But once in a while I'd find, you know, a World War II vet. I knew I knew an uncle of a friend of mine was a decorated Marine war hero, mm -hmm. a Guadalcanal, which was a bloodbath, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but during World War II, before our time, Arthur Wormuth was celebrated. They had World War II bubblegum cards that were like baseball cards, yes. you know, when, when we were kids. And, and Wormuth had his own bubblegum card, didn't he? World War he had his own bubblegum card. And we want to say one scene, Andy. You know, if we look at heroism, so the Japanese, they're way more advanced. They're prepared for war. Americans are coming in uh, cold uh, to this island in the jungle, um, the Philippines, and they're stealing the American, they, they're stealing the signals of uh, the communications of the Americans. So Wormuth is like, I'm going to go in there behind enemy lines, find where their communication is and destroy it. And I'm going to do this either alone, or he did have a local uh, Filipino named Jocko, who was like his, his, his helper. And he never failed to give this man credit. And he goes in and, you know, Dylan, if we could show the, uh, show, show the card, he basically kills the two guys and then dismantles all of the power. And this was such a known thing that on this bubblegum card, we see him doing the shooting the guy right there. The radio, you see uh, the, the radio signal um, is uh, in, in the back. And then there's a description of what this man did and they call him ex-football star. You know, like that's what uh, he came in. Certainly he was, he was physically fit, but the mental side, Andy. Okay. Meant the, 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 the ability to go in again, again to enemy lines. You don't have 
50 people raising their hand saying, I'll do this, you know, but, but we have no, this no. one man. I, I would not have been, I would not have been one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was such an epic event that they captured it on this, what they call war gum card. And little kids read this stuff, you know, teenager, 10 year old boys, you know, when you're reading about, them, they've got these cards and they're reading about this man. And uh, so this was a successful you know, if we could just uh, press on uh, through throughout the war, this was one successful well, then, attempt. Then, then, but, let me let me let me add well, just let me add one thing here, here, Robert. Uh, so early in the war, this is you know January, February, March, nineteen forty-two. The Americans are taking a beating, you know, all over the Pacific, right? They, you know, the the U.S. Navy was hammered at Pearl Harbor. Wake Island, you know, falls to the J Japanese, you know, and the Philippines is, has fallen, uh, Baton, Baton Peninsula and eventually Corregidor holds out for a while. Douglas MacArthur has to, has to, you know, flee to, to, to fight another day. And, and the Americans are desperate for war heroes. They're desperate for some good news, which is why the Doolittle raid that spring was, was that in June of 42? I forget. No, June of 42 was, was midway. So maybe it was April or May of forty two, the Doolittle Raid when they right. bombed Tokyo. That's and right. Mm -hmm. Didn't have didn't have a lot of military value, but it showed the Japanese, hey, we could still throw a punch. You know, we're not going down quietly, and it, and and it's and it gave spirit and hope to the Americans. And oh, yes. finally, you know, some good news. And so desperate for war heroes and some good news on the war front. Arthur Warbeth gave gave that to them. He was putting up this yeah. courageous resistance. He and his Filipino Rangers, you know, putting up courageous resistance to Japanese aggression, you know, on the on, on the Bataan Peninsula. And 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 a lot of people at home, you know, celebrate this. And hence the uh, you know the World War II yes. bubblegum cards here, celebrating his yes. uh, you know his heroic accomplishment. Great point, Andy. And also, not only is is are people like uh, Wormuth inspiring Americans and Filipinos, <clears throat> he's also undercutting the confidence of the Japanese because they think there's a full army and they can't see it. And they're calling this man a ghost. Okay, we know <laughs> ghosts don't exist, but they they just cannot account for all of the, the deaths that are happening by this one man army. So one of the relentless, you know, relentlessness and courage again, jump out in this man's story. So at one point he, he goes down into a ditch where there are Japanese uh, down there. You know, he's, he's crawling, he's got bugs in, you know, in his face and, and mosquito bites and all this stuff. Goes down into this ditch and two of them, they're not armed, but two Japanese, uh, uh, they have a bayonet and they, they pin this man's arm against the wall, okay, breaking like some of, his, uh, some, some of his bones, but he's fighting them off with his right hand. Andy, this is like Rambo, okay? Uh, yeah. And yeah, right. then he calls his buddy Jocko, comes down, helps him, you know, get out of it. And then he is captured. And while he's captured, one of the manual labor uh, things they're, they're forcing um, the Americans to do, the, the prisoners, is to um, <clears throat> set up a, a, a landing field for, for uh, airplanes in the uh, Philippines. And he purposely figures a way to make it the planes unable to land. Uh, he causes more death. You know, he takes these five gallon cans of, of drum, drum, drums of gas and he blows up bridges. He, he'll put hand grenades into, into like just every single thing, whatever was a weapon, he found a way, you know, through his mind to utilize it from maximum uh, death to the enemy so that the, the, the Filipinos in this case and, and the Americans can live another day to move on. I just find that fascinating. Right. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. The daring do is just is off the charts. And again, I you know, want to point out, you know, war is hell. Sherman's absolutely right. Uh, it's horrible, yeah. but unfortunately, there are bad guys in the world. There are Nazis. There were yes. Nazis. There are communists. There are yeah. jihadists. There are guys who will kill innocent people, conquer free countries, and we need we need war heroes to. You know, I don't want to do it. I don't have the kind of courage to do what Arthur Wormuth and, and many others do. But, you know, somebody, so if we're gonna, if we're gonna uh, uh, survive as a free country, then somebody's gotta do it. And, and yeah. Wormuth did this brilliantly, you know, against the Imperial Japanese uh, army. And let's, let, you know, let's repeat, Imperial Japan um, was a war machine. This was a brutal, you know, semi-fascist dictatorship. And remember, mm -hmm. this was, state Shinto was the religion and, you know, the religion had mandated that the Japanese empire was going to conquer the Pacific. They had God on their side. 
They thought they were invincible and they had, they had victory after victory after victory to corroborate that belief that God mandated the spread of the Japanese empire. Well, somebody like Arthur mm -hmm. Wormer, like, like you said, it's a good point, Robert. He's undermining that confidence, you know, by being so destructive you know, of, their, of their war effort. It's the same thing that the Doolittle Raid did. It undermined the Japanese confidence that the Japanese homeland was impregnable. And, you know, the U.S. Navy said, well, no, it isn't. You know, and the, and the U.S. Army, the Air, Air Force, these were those Army flyers are Navy carriers. But still, these are, these are Americans throwing a blow effectively at the, at the Japanese uh, forces and, you know, pricking holes in their, in their belief in an, an impregnable Japanese empire. And, and so this was, this yeah. was psych warfare is often psychological. And this is psychological warfare as well as, you know, physical warfare. It's very effective. Mm -hmm. Ghost of Bataan, yes. the Japanese call it. Yeah. So, Andy, let's let's just, I'd like to unpack this idea of uh, the difference between courage and rashness. So twice, Wormuth is injured and he's in a hospital. And the hospital, first time, the hospital gets taken over by, by the Japanese. <clears throat> and he, he's only in for one week and he's like, I got to get back out there. Put, put me in coach, I'm, I'm ready to play. And the doctor's like, you're not ready. But he he just goes out. Second time, they're like, absolutely, you're not ready. And he escapes from the hospital. He doesn't even tell them, you know, he just, this man was determined to preserve human life at, at I can't say at any cost, but at costs which could possibly border on being rash. And just, but when you have this moral certainty and, and this, this confidence in your own abilities, Andy, I don't think it's, I don't think it spills over. And I just want to take a word, uh, uh, just take a moment here to use, um, you know, the first philosopher who talked about courage, <clears throat> Aristotle, and this is in, in his Eudemian ethics. Uh, he says, courage makes one endure what is frightening for the sake of something so that one does so neither due to ignorance or due to pleasure, but because it is noble. So the nobility of battle and wanting to go out there, even if you're injured, even against doctor's orders, he couldn't do today. The, 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 the medicals would not let him go out again today. So he did this so many yeah. times. Uh, just yeah, he was, out he was, he was, they changed the rules. But, but let's just talk, can we just unpack that a, a yeah. little bit? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. And Wormuth, was seriously wounded several times. What did he end up with? Four Purple Hearts, I think, for, for Four various Purple Hearts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and kept going back out at the battle, leaving the hospital against doctor's orders to, when he lost, yeah. he was weak from loss of blood. Um, and you're, you're raising a, you know, an important moral question here. Um, you know, there are, there are times when risking your life like, like this would be rash. They said, no, stay in the hospital and rest. You know, you got to recover. You lost, you lost a lot of blood. But, but you know, the con context matters. You, you mentioned Aristotle. Aristotle was one of the first to point out moral, the, the, the moral nature of, of, a, of an action is conditioned by its context. And if you're fighting for liberty, this case for the Philippines, uh, but also you're fighting, you know, for America because the Japanese are going to, you know, are going to conquer the Pacific and I don't know if, if realistically the Japanese could have invaded North America, but they certainly could have put a stranglehold on on the Pacific and Amer you know, an, an American trade uh, with Australia. American let's say, American, Amer yeah, yeah, uh, severely harmed you know the the, Amer the U.S. economy and maybe possibly invaded the West Coast, although I, I I doubt it. But anyhow, you're fighting for liberty. The context matters here. You you know, uh, you, you at, at that point you 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 do what's got to be done. The Japanese are going to overrun the Bataan Peninsula and it's going to be a disaster. The American forces are going to be. Uh, either killed or captured. We know the Japanese are brutal. They're gonna, God knows how they'll torture the American uh, POWs. You, we gotta resist at all costs. We have to, you know, we have to, uh, I think it is at all costs. We have to uh, protect the Japan, uh, the Americans and the Filipinos here from brutal Japanese conquest. And so the, the, I think the context matters and in a different context where it's not mm -hmm. life and death, uh, you know, and, and liberty at stake for many innocent people, this would be rash. In fact, it'd be beyond rash. It'd be stupid. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you risk your yeah. life for what? You, you risk your life. You know, yeah. And here's a criticism I have of brave people who, who engage in these extreme sports. 
you know, they'll surf 100 foot waves or, you know, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll helicopter up to the top of a peak that's never been skied before, knowing that when they ski down, they're going to start an avalanche and they're skiing for their, you know, for their lives. Yeah, all right, it's your life. You want to do that, but I don't, I don't think that's such a good idea. I, you know, I think we could say, you know, for, for thrills, for fun, that strikes me as rash. You know, I, I, I know people can disagree because they, they may love that sport. I get it, but that strikes me as rash. But this is in defense of, of a noble moral principle, defense of liberty and, 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 and yeah. the life of many innocent Americans and Filipinos. And I think the, the context shows this, is, this isn't rash. This, he's, he's the only guy who could do it, you know, who, who, could, who could be exactly, the one-man yeah. army of baton. He's the only one who could do it. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I think, we, I, I think we could close out this section, Andy, and move on more to his bio and fill, fill out some of these other questions that we talked about uh, on being like a prisoner of war and the treatment there and military heroes. But I'll say you're watching uh, The Hero Show brought by Objective Standard Institute. Uh, please like and share this uh, program. We have other podcasts. We have a lot of courses going on right now. So objectivestandard.org is where you can find all that material. And uh, Andy, so let's let's see how this man became who he was uh, in life. And then, as I said, we could talk about some of these other themes. Uh, in right. This, in this well, Arthur Wormuth's dates were 1915 to 1981. So he's born yeah. during World War One, although prior to U.S. involvement in, in, in World War One. Yeah. Uh, I, I forget, was he born in South Dakota, moved to Chicago, or he was born that's, in that's Chicago, right. moved to yep. South Dakota? I don't, that's know. right. Yes. Uh, know, no, uh, born in South, the first one had it. Born in South Dakota, okay. moved to Chicago. Father was a World War I doctor. <laughs> so maybe that's how we learned not to hang out. <laughs> the doctor's like, you, he would just, you know, give a guy a Band-Aid. Okay, you're good to go. But <laughs> go back out there. And maybe by World War II, that was <laughs> steeped in, in uh, Wormitz's mind. I don't, I, I can't, I can't neither confirm nor deny that. But yeah, 1930s, he, go, he goes to college. He's playing football. He's known as a star uh, track for, uh, in, in different sports, football, track, uh, baseball, baseball, and crewing. Yeah. And he has a nickname, uh, Satch. That was like uh, what they called him, studied uh, bacteriology. So again, this is a practical, you know, if I'm laying around and uh, crawling through the jungle, bacteriology is something I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, like what, what you know, <laughs> what's poisonous, what's not. Uh, and and so those are helpful. Then he it's goes into the army. This, yeah. this great war hero right. studies bacteriology. It's, the, it's not a, you know, you, would, you wouldn't have, have guessed that. You know, uh, but yeah. yeah, well, he was the son of a doctor, so he's, he, he was a he was helpful, as was Aristotle, if yeah. we're talking about yeah. uh, gigantic heroes, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> right, right. He was the son of a doctor, and, and, and uh, there was that integration of mind and body. And uh, he spent time, didn't, uh, I know he, didn't he go, go back to South Dakota and work, didn't he work like on the, on the frontier or, you know, in the, in the, in the West doing, you know, he, he got, you know, he got steeped in, in what, you know, in, in, in being out on the land, tracking game, yes. hunting, you know, and, and all of this, all of this tough guy frontiersman, kind of, even though it was the 20th century by this time, uh, this, uh, the wild west of legend is, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. the wild west of Shane mm -hmm. is not, uh, not around anymore. Uh, and Shane's right. fictional anyhow. But you know, but he but he was steeped in the in in the in this frontier ways of you know you know of hunting and tracking and just toughing it out in the elements and and everything, which cer certainly served him well in the during the you know during the war in, in Bataan. And that's the era of the rugged individualist. Okay, where that term used to be so popular in American jargon. There were so many units, and Wormer fit right in with that. So he joined. He's in the army in in the 30s, 1936, but 1941, he goes to the Philippines and um, just right away, December, 1941, he's a captain. And then January is when the uh, he's put into action right away. So not a lot of time to get, you know, to, to coordinate uh, some kind of effort. And so he's kind of thrown into, you know, into the fire here. And immediately they just kill like 500 Japanese and um, just continually fight as, as we had covered earlier. Um, but the interesting yeah, thing he, here is, yeah. Listen, interject for a second. He went into combat, his trademark, 
Thompson submachine gun, you know, the, the Tommy gun, and two pistols holstered at his hips like an old, you know, Wild West gunslinger. And, yes. uh, you know, and uh, and obviously a knife because he's doing, you know, silent, you know, stealth uh, to the death combat at night in the, in the jungle. So uh, he's armed to mm -hmm. the teeth. And he was an expert, you know, even even though the Wild West was history by the time he was born, spent a lot of time 